Hello, and welcome to Art and Aesthetically Dark. I hope you like this. This is where I read books that are like horrors, or thrillers, or just something really inviting, and you know, I, and I tell you about it while I paint a picture, or just paint something, I don't know, it's gonna be something. And at any rate, at least see, see what happens, right? Now, the first story we are dealing with in this little series even. Oh, mind you, um, for future reference, for right now, uploads would be irregular because, like, you know, painting takes time, but I have a few, uh, on hand, so at least we have something to look at and listen to. So the story we're looking at in today's episode is The Hounds of Tindalus by Frank Belknap, Belk, Belk, Belknap? Yeah, Belknap. Long. He has nearly seven decades of bodies of works, including but not limited to 29 novels, 150 short stories, eight collections of short stories, three poetry collections, and numerous freelance work in comic books he scripted. He was a long prominent force in contribution for the science fiction scene during his time. And he was good friends with Ray Bradbury and H.P. Lovecraft, the later of whom he contributed to the Cthulhu mythos. He passed away January 3rd, 1994, and his works are still enjoyed to this very day. We're even reading it today. Look at that. He writes various strange stories, and I myself will be telling you guys one of my favorite stories of his, which is The Hounds of Tindalus. I like this story. Uh, a lot of horror, supernatural, or sci-fi tales, because from like a practitioner standpoint, it teaches a lesson to value. And the lesson this story teaches is to listen to try not, and is to, well, honestly, the lesson is, is uh, basically don't fuck around and find out. Basically, this is a, this is a story of you, maybe you shouldn't fuck around and find out. So the story starts out with an occult writer by the name of Chamblers, whose first name I really don't remember and I don't care about, but he's staring out his window because he's ready to meet up with his friend Frank, who is actually the author. He inserted himself in the book, basically playing himself, which I absolutely adore. I love when people do that. Not like that Stephen King thing where like he just plays a character. No, I want you to play your fucking self. I want to see if you can survive your own monster. Run, motherfucker, run. But, you know, I'm, I'm being extra right now. I'm, I, I'm on my second cup of coffee, so that's why. My bad. Chandler's is described as a pale man with a long nose and that he's pretty much living that extra gothic life. He really doesn't have electric lights, but he enjoys candles instead. And he didn't have a car, if I remember right. He is very big into medieval aesthetic and occult stuff, which I don't blame him because that shit is gorgeous. Um, but it's pretty obvious because he's an occult writer. That's literally who this person is. He writes the occult. He studies the occult. Chandler's is in that. However, what is not obvious is all the mathematical formula and theories from Einstein that Chandler's has laying out with his witchy shit, which is something that uh, Frank happens to notice when he first gets there, right? Uh, and this is because Frank and Chandler's don't exactly agree when it comes to science and occult stuff. And it gets to the point where I don't know why they're friends. I, I don't know. They're more like frenemies. Like Trisha Paytas and Ethan Klein. That's who they are. They're frenemies. You know? They're just around each other because they need someone to hate. And they fulfill that need with each other. Maybe it's my inner anime girl popping out. Because I have a problem with shipping. Even in my like late 30s. Something. I don't know. But like they they honestly... I Which is weird. Because it's just like when you really put them together they make more sense. But everybody always wants to be on a fence about one over the other. And it's the weirdest thing. But at the same time, it's just like, oh, Frank said, I had this. And it's, stop! No. No, we're not doing that anymore. We just can't ship people together just because they have a mutual hatred that could elite, that could possibly just some passionate sex scenes if it's written out correctly. Now, back to the story. That's, now, Frank asked Chandler's about all of this. You know, why is your shit sitting around? And why is this shit mixed with this shit? It doesn't belong here. Okay, so Frank's asking Chandler's about this. Like, why is this and this together? These don't match together. You don't even like talking about science. You think most of it is some hoodoo shit. What are you doing, Chandler's? What are you up to? I want to know about the bear. Like, Frank's getting all up in that, right? He's confused about, like, why Chandler's is interested in Einstein's theory, which Chandler's replies back that Einstein is a priest of transcendental math. I, I think I said that right. Transcendental 
mathematics instead of a physicist or a scientist. Um, and he isn't against science, which is like... Isn't the physicist, the priest, the transcendental mathematics anyway? Like, that's pretty much the point. That's like going to a produce associate, giving them an apple to change it from red to green. And and, and then calling them a fruit wizard. It, like, what's the difference? What's the difference? His problem with science is that it's taking too long to help humanity and that a time travel is a big deal. Time travel, for some reason, is a really big deal. It's such a big deal, in fact. He's even suggesting that Einstein, with all of his formulae and studies and mathematics, is hiding something in regard to time travel unfairly. Dun dun dun! Chandler thinks that since science and Einstein were dragging their feet and that maybe the insight of the occult could step in and do a, the job better. Which is just like, okay, but if they're hiding something, why are you trying to figure out? You know, sometimes people hide things for good reasons. Maybe not good reasons to other people, but it's always good reasons to them. But sometimes, just sometimes, there are, t there are moments when hiding things is to protect you because you might be stupid and fucks with it or worse it's gonna fucks with you this is the whole lesson of you know fucking around and what happens when you end up finding out so frank listens as chambers tells him that he found some old chinese drug because you know that's reliable that can allow him to enter the fourth dimension and go back through time and that humans have an imperfect perception of time basically chandler suggests that time isn't this linear string of events one after another but of all events all at once and that we only see them as linear because we can't go outside our own dimension to observe time outside of itself which yes and but no yes but no like yes but no um it's more like we ha everyone has their own time and space has time, so you gotta be a thing of this time. And you know what? I'm not getting into like science and physics and shit right now. That's gonna be way too confusing. You know, Frank's kind of reluctantly agreeing with this, but he's. I'm not. I'm not entirely sure if it's because he understood what was going on, or if it was one of those smile and nod sort of deals. You know, when someone already tells you something three times, and after the third time, you just act like you heard him, but you really didn't. Maybe he was doing one of those numbers. I probably would have. Interested. I really, I'm, I would love to hear more about, like, I know there was more in the book, but it was one of those things where, like, I can't keep reading this, I'm tired. So Chandler's has five pellets of this Chinese drug called Liao, I think. I'm not sure if that's pronounced right. Which leads him to also go on some diatribe about Tao. No, Dao. Even though it starts with the T, it's pronounced Dao. Which causes Frank to be like, hey, that sounds like some bullshit. But then Frank agrees to help him anyway. So I don't know why he bothered calling bullshit on his friend if he's going to help him anyway. Maybe they have other things in common back in the day or something. I'm not sure, but like, it seems like the two of them really don't like each other. It's almost like Hi and what's his fate? Lanyon, that's his name. Like, if Frank and Chandler's is like Edward Hyde in Lanyon from the strange case of Dr. Jekyll. Like, it's like that relationship, so they hadn't gotten to the point where they're ready to, like, fight each other or some shit. Lanyon was ready to fight Hyde, or Jekyll, though. He really wanted to. So Chandler's wants to dictate his adventures. He wants to dictate what's happening to Frank. He wants to tell him the adventures, and he wants him to write it down about what's it like going back through time. And Frank's all like, I'm getting bad vibes from this, bro. And Chandler's, like, sends back, no problem, man. I already did a vibe check. We're good. And Frank doesn't trust that, which is a good thing, because Chandler's, in fact, did not do a vibe check. In fact, Chandler's barely invested in any sort of research in what the fuck he was doing. And, and But the research he's about to do is the excellent kind where it's like, this is what happens when you fuck around and find out. And I'm going to keep saying that. Like, monetization doesn't matter. I just got on this shit. So it's just like, yeah, um, this is on some F around and find out right here. That's what's going to happen. So Frank is once again being like, this isn't a good idea. Like, this rooster is cocking his doodle-doo for the third time now. But like, yeah, let's ignore the fact that like someone's going to do something some shit right let's 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 just let's just ignore what's gonna happen because that's easier now like i'm not sure 
And I'm pretty sure Frank's not sure if the Dow or any of that bullshit exists. Like, you don't even know what this drug's gonna do to you, Chambers. You fucking weirdo. What are you doing? So, like, Frank is once again being like, this isn't a good idea, Chandlers. I'm not sure the dowry, that bullshit exists. You don't even know what that drug's going to do to you, man. You're a fucking weirdo. Why do we have to do this? And Chandlers is, like, all again saying that he knows what he's doing. He just doesn't want to get lost in time. A.K.A. lose his mind from a bad trip, like some LSD he got from his dealer who said it was from China or some shit. Uh, he actually doesn't have any control. He's a liar. Frank knows he's lying, but he really can't call him out because he doesn't know exactly what he's lying about. The lie is he knows what he's doing. That That's the thing. He's lying about knowing what he's doing. But after giving another excuse why this will work, Frank for the last time tells Chandler is this experiment is really giving off the worst bad vibes he's ever had. Uh, even though he and Chandler don't seem to get along well, they're still friends, and he's telling his friend that this is a bad idea. And Chandler literally calls his friend a little old bitch. Like, well, the, the actual quote is, don't be an asinine old woman. But it, it's the same thing. It's it, it means the same thing. It's just different words. I said it in an easier way. Uh, but I gotta say, I'm impressed at how writers, like, can curse people out without saying the words. But the two proceed anyway, and as soon as Chandler pops the drug and all the clocks stop, Frank's reached out to get him, but Chandler stops him and allows everything to happen. So... He lays down and Franks gets to writing and soon everything appears black to Chandler's. He eventually begins seeing everything that happens before, and going backwards anyway. He tells Frank that he can see civilizations rise and fall. He can see how cities and towns and nations developed, how victories and wars went down, how the rulers and leaders of nations succeeded and their people failed and they failed their people. Eventually Chandler's goes far enough back to find this period before time where all there is is angles and curves. And this is where he should have stopped. In fact, he shouldn't have never gotten to this point. Because, like, this is a no-no area. This is the no-no square. Hey, you can't go in there. That's a no-no square. And he went right the fuck in. He went right in. Now, I'm, I don't know if he, had, if he had done research, if he would have known not to go back this far. Don't really matter, though. So, like, he ends up entering the strange angle in search for more information. And he describes this angle as having an unearthly horror behind it. And then all of a sudden, he just starts flipping his shit and writhing on the floor like he's being attacked. Uh, Frank helps his friend out of the bad effects of the drug by giving him some whiskey. Because the best cure for a drug is alcohol, apparently. And Chamber tells Frank of these creatures called the Hounds of Tindalus that smell terrible and putrid. And they are born of angles. Whereas our dimension is bored of curves. And apparently there's some cosmic energy in man that, like, the hounds are hungry for. And they're evil. But not in the sense of what we perceive as the evil. But more like a mindless, senseless hunger for what is curved or some. I, he's, he, like, it was a bad trip. It's a really bad trip. He's freaking out. He He's grabbing his friend. There are tears streaming down his face. He is crying like a young lady. This poor man. You know, Frank is all like, I'm going home, and I'm calling you a shrink. I'll talk to you later. And then he goes home, leaving Chandler's by himself. So the next morning, Chandler's calls him in a panic, and the next thing Frank knows, he's buying 20 pounds worth of plaster, which is like $50 at Ace Hardware. So it's like, it's, it's not that expensive, actually. Well, it was before 2023. I don't know what it is now. It's probably like a good 100 pop. We have inflation. Uh, now, why is he buying the plaster, you might be asking? It's because Chandler's begged him to. Why did Chandler's beg him to? Um, we're going to get there. So he gets to Chandler's place, and Chandler is just going all mad lad on his house and on Frank as soon as he gets there. He tells Frank that he needs his help to turn all the angles in the room into curves rather than angles or corners, right? So to make sure you understand, Chandler just asks his friend in a frantic state to help get him plaster. And then informs him, his friend that he needs to cover all the corners and angles of the room in plaster to make them curves. So the hounds of Tindalus don't find him and hopefully return to their place in time once they can't find Chandler's. Because apparently the hounds can only enter through angles or corners. So that's why I wanted to turn them all into curves. So the hounds of Tindalus can't, you know, get them. Now, anyone else would would assume that this man is tripping. Any, anyone else. But Frank, he's a good man. 
He's a good man and he's a good friend. He's a better friend than I am because Frank goes and helps Chandler's for four hours and turning all these angles and corners and the curves. And after the two of them are done, Chandler's is feeling pretty confident that his last ditch effort at protection is going to work. But you got to remember, plaster takes like a minute or a thousand to dry, so we're clear. Also, I'm not sure if the walls of his house is also plaster. Just keep that tucked away in your pocket. Keep it... It's save it for a rainy. So Frank at some point is like, hey fam, you gonna go talk to that shrink like I want you to? Cause that would be good for you, man. And Chandler's basically goes off on Frank, just out, off, uh, like just uh, straight off the handle. Um, the paraphrase more than I already have. Chandler's calls Frank a square, which you a narrow mind to understand the complexities of the occult shit and how he could never understand or comprehend anything is beyond this dimension, pretty much saying Frank is dumb. Mind you, spent, mind you, Frank spent half a day, maybe a quarter of the day, with the dude on drugs. Came back the next day after spending $50 on said friend. Then spent four hours with the guy doing manual labor for no reason other than because the dude saw some dugs that smelled bad on a bad trip. Now, I'm into the craft, right? I'm witchy. Now, I know I'm a witch and all, but this sounds like some crackhead meth behavior. This sounds like some a crackhead. Who dabbles in magic with you? This is like a crack wizard, is what it is. This is crackhead behavior. <laughs> this is crackhead behavior. Little bit of meth, but he's not dancing around. He just keeps freaking out. So it's more than likely just crack. Pretty sure Frank did too, because he storms out without a word. And I don't blame that man. And then Chamberlain trying to, to apologize after being an ungrateful and smug jerk to his friend. I don't think he answers. I don't, I don't think Frank was. I don't. I think Frank was like, I don't give a fuck. So, the next part of the story ends with two articles from the news and an excerpt from one of Chandler's writing. The first story talks about an earthquake of unusual severity hitting the area at 2 a.m. It caused a lot of damage and started fires in electric systems and railways to, like, fuck up. The second article is titled, Occult Writer Murder by Unknown Guest. Take a guess who? You don't need to, because it was Chandler's, of course. It was Chandler's. They found him in the morning of the earthquake, mainly because there was a putrid smell coming from his door that led to the main hallway of his apartment building. The neighbor that lived across from him tried to ignore the smell until he thought maybe that it was just a gas leak and got the superintendent. And then they went and opened the door and discovered that there wasn't any furniture, which is weird, and that there were scenes so terrible that it caused the superintendent just stare out the window for five minutes and just contemplate if he should jump or not. Like, sometimes you see things and you don't want to, and there's nothing you can do about it. Like, it's in your mind for the rest of your life. It's one of those. Um, what was it? Chandler's body all over the floor, naked and covered in weird blue substances that chemists find to be a discovery science actually can't explain, but will possibly lead to new learning. So, good on him. He helps aid science with weird blue shit all over his naked body. Uh, so I guess you could say that Chandler's accomplished this mission of helping and aiding science. But damn, it came at a price. Uh, his head is severed from the body and was staged on his chest with the most disturbing features on it. Uh, the plasters he and Frank put up the day before it came down when the earthquake struck and the pieces were arranged near Chandler's body in the form of an angle by an unknown person. There were charred yellow papers next to Chandler's. Thank you, Phil. Uh, which were his thoughts hours before his demise. He had written in how the new curve should protect him and how the satyrs or whatever they are should protect him. Which is like, where the fuck did they come from? Like, wh why would... I, I, they, just a whole new kind of animal comes out of nowhere, like, adding shit in. Last minute. That's not cool. But whatever. And how the earthquake struck eventually, like, met his paper. But his final words were... Ah, we're all literally on the paper, which is, that's just stupid. I'm sorry, but no one's going to write that right before they're murdered. They scream out, not write a horror novel, which is ironic for me to say, but still. The very last part of the story is an extra from the writing of Chandler's, in which the last lines read, I shall travel in time and meet it face to face. The it he was actually referring to is the new life that he knew existed outside of time. Which, he was right, just not the way he was thinking. If Chandler's is correct and Einstein did know about these hounds of Tindalus, he had actually a good reason not to reveal their existence to the world. They would have left blue shit, blue jizz all over people and then put angles 
around the like it's a forty dollar bill you leave on the dresser. Like it's not that like we appreciate the gesture, but you are not a praying mantis, and we don't need that kind of cur. We don't even take that kind of cur. Like, could you imagine someone breaking down your door, unaliving you, and then, like, using the pieces of your door to leave, like, a weird-ass message? Wouldn't that be fucked up? That would be fucked up as fuck. Apparently, Einstein would have had a really good reason not to reveal their existence to the world. Perhaps Chandler's realized that Einstein had left the formulae incomplete on purpose, and then he discovered the discrepancy with great glee, as if he could join with the scientists of the world to change and improve human life for all with the occult devices and tools. Unfortunately, Chandler's does what a lot of people who have no business in such strange and obscure things to do. Uh, they nib nose and snoop until they find something that should never be found. We don't know in the story if the Hounds of Tindalus will return to that period, or if it was just Chandler's they were wanting for learning of their existence. And it's quite obvious that Chandler's waited too late to set up protection and wars for himself against the Hounds. And despite his friend's words of wary, Chandler's continued his own demise. He wanted to fuck around and he found out. That's what it was. It's a good story and if you want to read it, I believe there's a copy of the story at goodreads.com and there are plenty of collections of Frank Belknap Long that you can read and are just as entertaining. He, is, he's really an interesting writer. I really like his style. I hope you guys enjoyed the story because that's the end. I will talk to you later and I love your face. Rejoice.